Please join me as we continue our worship in praying together the collect of the day. Keep your church, O Lord, by your perpetual mercy, because without you, the frailty of our nature causes us to fall. Keep us from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable for our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. A reading from the book of Psalms. The first section of Psalm 22, verses 1 through 21a. Why have you forsaken me? To the cry of master, according to the dole of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God. I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. Yet you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. 
you made me trust in you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stay in for a reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Is he the king of Israel? Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lava sapachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. And I want to invite all of our children to head over now to the Gunnel House for your time um, with your friends. How's everybody doing? Good morning. I was saying to my husband yesterday that I think I am the luckiest priest because not only do I get to preach three times in one Sunday, but I get to preach outside. I mean, come on now. (laughs) I also get to wear a casual dress. I'm not wearing the vestments. I'm not flapping up here. This is great. This is a good Sunday. Are you sweating a little bit just yet? You know, you can do it. 
Um, but in all seriousness, no, it is an absolute delight uh, to get to share God's word with you this morning and to get to worship in the beauty of God's creation. So before we open up this scripture together, let me open us up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you because you are good and you are most worthy of praise. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would open our hearts to receive whatever you want to say to us this morning, that you would open our eyes to see you high and lifted up, and that you would open our minds to comprehend the amazing love you have for us. So we just invite you, Holy Spirit, now to speak. Um, Whatever is from you, I pray that you would amplify it. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see that hopefully my sermon manuscript doesn't fly away in the wind. Um, Okay, yeah, is the mic turned off? Yeah. Grab the spare microphone. Okay, do you want me to? Okay, I'm, wow, you know, (laughs) um, what do you do when hard things happen? When you get the call from the doctor and the news isn't good? When you lose the baby, when your best friend betrays you or that horrible thing happens and you wonder, where were you, God? What happened? Why didn't you stop it? Is your arm too short to save? When you can't pay the bills or you can't get pregnant or the person you thought you would marry breaks your heart instead. In this morning's psalm, we meet David at one of the lowest points in his life. David, the champion in battle. David, the wild-hearted worshiper. David, who was unafraid to dance. David, the shepherd boy who could kill a lion with his bare hands and fell a giant with a swing sling. This David is now crying out to God in prayer. He's been broken. And we're not told how or why or when. We're only given his words and what words they are. I am a worm and not a man. I am poured out like water. You lay me in the dust of death. David is emptied out like a dry well with nothing left to give And nowhere left to go, he describes his heart like wax melted within him. He has no more will to fight. He's like a wounded animal left for dead. And the predators are beginning to circle. And David paints a picture of his enemies slowly surrounding him like strong bulls, ravenous lions, and hungry dogs. It's this haunting image. And the worst part of all is that God seems silent. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. David feels abandoned, like God has walked out of the room and left him stranded, vulnerable, and besieged. Have you ever been there? And sometimes the hard happens a little more slowly than that. Over the course of a tiny, tiny, thousands of tiny disappointments, you know, you don't make the team. You get passed up for that promotion. The house you bid on, that you love, that you've dreamed of, goes to someone else. And over time those tiny little disappointments begin to add up, right? And suddenly, you're not just having a hard day, not just having a hard week, you're in the midst of a hard season. And I think it's important to talk about this because we all experience it at some point in our lives. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble And our stories, our lives, they reflect this truth. Because of the pervasiveness of sin and its effects, because the ongoing powers of evil, none of us are spared the experience of pain. 
And I also think it's important to talk about this because often what leads people to walk away from the church or to deconstruct their faith is not some realization of some better truth. No, it's an experience of pain. It's suffering, either theirs or of someone they love. And in the midst of it, it's so disorienting that they end up walking away. And as I thought about this, it's, it's what we do with this pain. It's how we respond to the suffering that matters. What do we do when hard things happen? And as I asked this question and I sat with the words in Psalm 22 this past week, God gave me a picture And this is one of the ways that God speaks to me. Um, And it was a picture of a ship in a storm. And the winds were so strong. And it was so dark. And the waves were so strong that I saw this sailor. And the sailor lost his footing and he was going to slide off the ship. And it was in that moment as I sat with a picture of the storm, it was like the Lord said to me that navigating hard seasons is like sailing in a storm. And what we need more than anything when we're in the midst of the storm is to be held by something bigger and stronger than ourselves. And then God reminded me of this thing that that sailors would do. They would actually tie a rope around their waist and tether themselves to the ship so that when the waves came and the dark got really dark, they wouldn't slide off the deck. They were held. And as I thought about that, and I thought about our scripture, I realized that David gives us a map. He gives us a model for what it means to be tethered to Christ. And he shows us in Psalm 22 a number of those tethers of the things that will hold us fast when we're navigating the storm. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a few of those tethers. We're going to talk about the things that will hold us. And then We're going to look at the one to whom we are tethered, the one in whom this psalm is fulfilled. Does that sound good? You with me? A little hot? You can stretch out if you need to. Um, So first, what does David show us that will tether us? Well, he shows us that the first thing we need to do when we're in the midst of a hard season is actually to move toward God in prayer. We're really easily tempted to move away from God when something hard happens, right? You know this. When you have a conflict with your spouse or something hard happens with someone at work or one of your friends, and instead of pursuing them, instead of moving toward them to talk about the conflict, you slowly inch away. And if you keep doing this over time, it creates this giant distance between you. But David doesn't do that. He moves toward God. And it's amazing what he says in this prayer. This is not a a pious, perfect, polished up prayer. No, no. This is the kind of prayer that names our pain and offers it to the Father. And we see this throughout the first half of this psalm. Instead of pretending with God or walking away from God, David moves towards God with breathtakingly honest questions and complaints. He shows us that nothing is off the table when we're talking to God. We can risk being honest. Instead of burying his anger or pretending it isn't there, he brings it to the Father in prayer. He offers God his angst as a form of worship. Did you know you could do that? And we can speak freely to God as David does here because David knew that God is his Father. And we see this in verses 9 and 10. David says, You are he who took me from the womb. On you was I cast from my birth. And it's this beautiful image of God holding him as a father would hold his newborn child. And if you are a parent in this room, you you know what this feels like. The kind of affection that you have for your child, that unbelievable love that just springs up out of you. That, if you are in Christ, that is how God feels about you. He delights in you like that. He loves you like that. He's your father. And I don't know what kind of father you had, but I want to tell you that God is not an angry father. And God is not a critical father. And God is not judging you all the time. No, he loves you perfectly. He's the kind of father who runs out to meet you when you've fallen off your bike and your knee is bleeding and you are screaming. And he doesn't wait for you to come to the door 
and knock politely and say, please, daddy, can you give me a Band-Aid? No, he rushes to where you're wounded and he comforts you in that place. That's the kind of father we serve. He meets us in our pain. And to illustrate this, I want to share a story. So a few months ago, I was processing a disappointment with God in prayer. And I began to cry. I started crying. You know, and it was one of those days where I had somewhere to be. You know, I had already done my makeup. I don't have time for this. I'm like, Lord, not today. Um, And so in a moment of like real honesty with God, I said, Lord, can you just take these tears and shelve them? Can you put them away? And it was like I had in my mind this picture of God taking my grief and like shoving it in a closet. Like you would do a bag of clothes that you need to donate to Goodwill, but you haven't had the time for yet. And I was like, just take it away. Get rid of it. And I was, I was shocked and surprised by his response. I sensed him say to me, no, Abigail, I don't want to shelve your pain. I don't want to shelve your tears. I want to consecrate them. And I don't know about you, But when God spoke to my spirit like that, it was like something shifted within me. And that place inside of me that had been weighed down with disappointment and doubt began to fill with hope and gratitude. Gratitude for a holy God who doesn't waste anything and who loves us enough to want to use our pain for his holy purposes. You don't know what God can do with your suffering when you give it to him. How he can redeem it and use it for his glory and for your good. Will you trust him with it? But David doesn't just teach us how to offer God our pain. He actually shows us the importance of praise. We see this in the first half of this psalm. And it's really rather striking and surprising You know, David is pouring out his lament before God. And then in verse three, he just switches. He pivots to praise. And I think it has something to teach us. There's something for us to learn here that pain and praise aren't incompatible. They're interwoven. He says, yet you are holy. He's he's crying out and then yet you are holy. And then he cries out the truth. And he says, yet you're my father. It's this pivoting, this looking up. In the messy middle of his story, when the lions are still circling and he doesn't see a way out, he worships. Instead of allowing his circumstances to steal his faith, David looks up. He says, and yet. And as I thought about this powerful word, yet, this week, I realized that's what we do every Sunday in worship. In the face of our circumstances, we celebrate. We say, yet, God. We choose to declare his goodness and faithfulness even in the midst of our circumstances. And the beautiful thing is that when we worship, God responds. Scripture tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. He meets with us in a special way and he gives us the grace we need to continue running the race. The life of faith is an endurance sport. And Sunday worship is our weekly workout. It's where we strengthen our spiritual muscles together as we listen to the word and receive the bread and wine and worship with all the company of heaven. And over time, that rhythm of corporate worship actually tethers us to the grace of Jesus Christ and to love of God the Father and to the fellowship of the Holy Spirit so that we can't wander or fall off the boat because we know in our bones that he is good, even if our circumstances say otherwise. Sunday worship isn't optional for the believer seeking to run the race of faith. No, it's essential. Is it forms us and fills us and strengthens us. But it's not just worship that sustains our faith. It's tethering ourselves to the testimony of scripture and to the community of saints. And these are our brothers and sisters who have gone before us and our brothers and sisters who are beside us right now. In verses four and five, David writes, in you, our fathers trusted and you delivered them. 
To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And I love that David speaks in such general terms here. He doesn't say, in you Abraham trusted, though he did, or in you the Israelites trusted. No, he says, in you our fathers trusted. And in that way, he's referring to all of scripture and all the places in scripture where we see God saves. When David struggles to make sense of his story, he looks to the story of scripture. When David struggles to see the faithfulness of God, he looks to the faithfulness he sees in God's word. And when we're struggling to make a sense of our stories and we're struggling to trust and believe that is, God is good, we need to tether ourselves to God's word. To feed on those stories of God's faithfulness, it will generate trust and faith. And to allow the word of God, which is actually living and active, and through which the Holy Spirit speaks. So when we open it up, God actually can minister to our hearts in real time and give us the words and the encouragement that we need to keep going. But not only does scripture have a testimony to tell, you have a testimony to tell. And the person sitting next to you has a testimony to to tell. And the person sitting next to them, moments, stories of when God has been faithful to you. And when God has showed up when you needed him most and provided perfectly for you. Our stories have power because they point us to Christ. And that's why community groups and community nights are so important because there are these moments where we meet. And if we risk being vulnerable, if we risk sharing our stories, even the messy ones, even the hard ones, they might be the bomb and the encouragement that the person sitting next to you really needs to hear. Will you tell your story? When you're on mile 11 exhausted, I was a cross country runner, so I know this. What keeps you running? What keeps you in the race? It's the presence of the people cheering you on and it's the presence of the people running beside you. The whole company of heaven is cheering us on and the Trinity is cheering us on. And also we are looking to each other. Let's keep running, let's keep going. I know you're tired, here's some water. You wanna walk a little while with me. We need each other. So when you're navigating a hard season, name your pain. Risk being honest with God. Let him see the real you. He's not going to judge you. Show up for Sunday worship, even when you don't feel like it. Lean into praise. And steep yourself in scripture and community. It tethers us. And I want to say something so you don't misunderstand. I don't want you to hear me like loading you up with things to do. That's not my heart. The beautiful thing about a tether is that the tether holds you, you don't hold on. And when we're in hard seasons, God is holding us. We don't have to grip and strive and grab up to him. He is holding us. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. His grace is enough for us no matter your season. God will hold you. All we have to do is show up. And sometimes showing up looks like sitting in the pew or the chair and crying the whole service, right? Just because you need space and time to grieve and the best place to grieve is in the presence of God and his people. And sometimes showing up looks like reading God's word even when you don't feel like doing it or choosing to take a risk in conversation. The beautiful thing is that seasons don't last forever. The storm will shift. But when you're in the middle of one and you feel too weak to stand, let yourself be held by the liturgy, by your church family, and by the Lord. But the only reason we can show up and by God's grace be held in the loving arms of a father is because of the one who suffered in our place, the one who was tethered to the hard wood of the cross so that we might be saved. The beautiful thing about Psalm 22 is that not only does it teach us how to steward our suffering, it shows us the one who suffered in our place so that we might never be forsaken. If you grew up in the church, you might have recognized some things in Psalm 22, right? You might have heard some things that sounded familiar. Even if you were just listening to the gospel reading, right? You might have heard some things. That sounded familiar. 
What we find in Psalm 22 is a prophetic picture of the sufferings of Christ. The Holy Spirit actually inspired David to write a prayer that was true of his experience. And then that same prayer was actually fulfilled, was true of Jesus' experience nearly 1,100 years later. Isn't that amazing? If you don't believe me, listen in. I'm going to show you. In verse 16, David writes, They have pierced my hands and feet. And the ancient Greek, Arabic, Syriac, and Latin versions, all these versions of this verse have a verb here that can be translated as pierced, dug, or bored through. They pierced, they bored through his hands and feet. Centuries before the Romans invented the torture of crucifixion, David perfectly describes this practice. In fact, David's choice of verbs is so confusing that some Hebrew translations translate it differently. Because it didn't make sense. But God had a plan. In verse 18, David describes how they divided his garments among them. And for my garments, they cast lots. And if you know anything about the crucifixion story, you know that all four accounts describe about Jesus' clothing being divided among them. And for his garments, they cast lots. God had a plan. In verse 15, David describes being thirsty. Jesus cries, I thirst. David talks about being mocked. Matthew tells us that Jesus too was mocked. But get this, the very taunt that David's mockers use in verse 8, these very words, he trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. That's the very verse Jesus' mockers use in verse 8. Jesus' mockers use at the crucifixion. They literally use the language of Psalm 22 to mock Jesus on the cross. The parallels here are stunning. And of course, the opening words of the psalm are are Jesus' cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who could take the desperate prayer of a broken king and turn it into a prophecy of a coming Messiah? Only God. And why? Why did God sovereignly guide David and the writers of the Gospels to create this beautiful symmetry. He did it so that we might see and believe. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll find hundreds of examples of this. Stunningly accurate prophecies of Christ embedded throughout Scripture. And if you know the Bible, you know that it was written across thousands of years by radically different people in radically different places and cultures, and yet it coheres in extraordinary ways. And God did not do that because he's brilliant, even though he is. Or because he wanted to write a brilliant book, even though it is. No, he did it because he loves you. And he will stop at nothing to reveal himself to you. And we see this most clearly on the cross. What's striking about Psalm 22 is that God eventually rescues David. That's part two. That's what we'll get to hear about next week. His psalm of praise. But on Good Friday, it was very different. Another king cried out using David's words. But instead of running to save his son, the father turned his face away. And imagine with me for a moment what that would be like. To allow your son to be brutally killed when you could have easily stopped it. To hear his cry for mercy and stay your hand. To restrain yourself from saving. What would compel a father to endure such suffering? And what would compel a son to submit himself to die? Love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God did it for us. Because he loves us. Because he wanted you to be his daughter. Because he wanted you to be his son. Because he wants a relationship with you forever. And the only way to rescue you from death was to suffer in your place. Jesus was forsaken so that we would never be. And even when we feel forsaken, or like the odds are stacked against us, when he doesn't heal the way we hoped, when he doesn't give us the desire of our hearts, 
or answer the prayers the way we would have wanted. Even when it seems like the enemy has won, which sometimes it does seem that way, we can say, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego facing the fiery furnace, even if he does not deliver us, we will still trust him because in Christ, our eternity is secure. Through every season and every suffering of this life, we are held in God's hands. And if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, then nothing, nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of God. No sin, no sickness, no suffering, nothing. And on that day when he calls you home, whether it's tomorrow or 20 years from tomorrow, you can rest secure today knowing that you have an eternity of joy to look forward to where nothing will be stolen from you. Nothing will be taken away where God will literally wipe every tear and death shall be no more and there will be no more mourning no more crying and no more pain and if you do not yet know Christ as Lord today let me tell you today is your day all you have to do is say yes to him all you have to do is admit that you need him and he does all the rest Nothing in life is guaranteed except that one day we will die. And on that day, what will have mattered is whether or not we know Christ as Lord. Don't leave today without saying yes to him. He loves you. He knows you. And you can trust him with your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for the way that you minister to our hearts. I pray that you would continue to minister to us this day. Help us to know you and love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. When I fear my faith will fail Christ will hold me fast When the tempter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hold Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He will he bled and died Christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life he will hold me fast still our faith is turned to sight
Please join me as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we enter a time of prayer, I invite you to be seated. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay. My name is Debbie Hatfield, and I have the blessing of leading us in prayer this morning out here in this wonderful outdoor space. So let me start us off. Lord, we thank you that we can be together this morning. We thank you for the tremendous blessing of being sisters and brothers together in your presence, Lord. We thank you that you want us to bring our praises and requests to you and that you promise to hear us. Lord, you have commanded and promised us in the Gospel of Luke. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Help us to be faithful, Lord, in asking seeking and knocking, but especially in asking as we come to you now. So we pray for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being and unity of the people of God. We pray especially this morning for all peoples in Sudan, Ukraine, Venezuela, in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, Lebanon, and throughout the Middle East. We pray for protection against famine and provision of food and water, especially for those in Gaza and Sudan, and for refugees everywhere. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially for Joseph, our president, and Kamala, our vice president, members of Congress, the Supreme Court, state and local governments. Lord, grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. Lord, in your mercy. For Steve, our Archbishop, and Chris, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, for Jamie, Abigail, Steve, and Stephen, and all others who serve on Truro staff. We also pray for Trinity Burke and Mike as he leads there. To all your people, give your heavenly grace, especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness 
all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. We pray especially this morning for our Toro Mission partners who are currently serving in Southeast Asia, the Pacific, Eastern Africa, and Latin America. And we pray especially for those in the Middle East right now in the midst of tensions and uncertainty. May your light shine through them to all peoples around them. We also pray for our educators at various schools who will begin classes again this coming week or soon. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. We pray especially for all of our brothers and sisters who are at times suffering in Sudan, Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. Please strengthen and protect your church and may your light shine through them in the midst of persecution. And as Abigail shared with us, may they know, Lord, that they are tethered to you. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, we pray especially for John, Bina, Richard, and Janet, as well as for those fighting long-term illnesses, Janice, Tom, Jennifer, Randy, Will, Roy, Toby, and Susan. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now, let us prepare to confess our sins to Almighty God. Please join me as we confess our sins using these words together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Well, you may be seated. Well, let me welcome you once again. Thank you for joining us on this wonderfully beautiful morning. As I share a few things happening in our life together, I'm asking our ushers to go ahead and lead us through our offering. Uh, if you'd like to give in the plate, you may do so now. You're also welcome to give to the 
ministry of this church and partner with us in the gospel and give to the Lord online if you'd rather that way. Thank you for your generous giving. Thank you for your partnership in ministry and in the gospel. And thanks to our ushers who are now serving us in this way. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We do this every week. Um, Most of the time, we do it in there. Uh, But just a few things are, 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 are different this morning. But if you're visiting, welcome. It's such a joy to have you. I would love to meet you after the service. So would Steve or Abigail or anybody on our team. Please find us up here or somewhere. Introduce yourself. We don't have our welcome cards today, but if you're new and visiting and would like to make a connection with one of us on the pastoral team, email clergy at truroanglican.com. And that goes to all the pastors here and just say, hey, I was visiting this morning uh, and we'd love to connect with you. Also, if there is anything we can pray for you about, we'd love to pray for you uh, this morning. After the service, we have wonderful prayer teams who are available to pray for you. I have no idea where they've agreed to stand and to pray for you. So I'm just going to make an executive decision, and I hope it's not wrong. And I'm going to say you should be prayed for in a shady place and in a fairly quiet place. So if you'd like to be prayed for for any reason whatsoever after the service, uh, just inside this door in our glass walkway, it's air-conditioned, it's quiet. As we tear equipment down, you won't be being disturbed and disrupted, so... Please don't hesitate to go to a brother and sister today after the service and ask for prayer. The best way to stay connected with us, with what's going on in our church, is to subscribe to our Truro News. That's our weekly email that comes out every Friday morning. You can find that, subscribe to it, read it on our website, clicking on news. So rather than me stand up here and try to summarize everything that's in there, let me just say to you, go online and read it. There's a lot of exciting things happening, coming up, and I'd love for you to be aware. I want to take a moment and pray for the parents, teachers, educators, and students in our midst. Fairfax County Public Schools goes back to school tomorrow. I think Loudoun goes back on Thursday. I don't know when all the different private schools and different school systems are starting or or homeschool routines when those start. But whether it's tomorrow or not, it's soon. And uh, I'm so glad Debbie already led us in a prayer for you. We want to pray for you again. I don't want to make you stand, because if you're a teacher, you're going to be standing for a lot of tomorrow, so just stay where you are. But if you are going back to school this week or next, we'd love to invite you, if you're comfortable where you're sitting, just to put your hands out like this to receive. And then if if this doesn't apply to you, just be aware of those around you, perhaps, who look like they're going back to school. We want to cover you with prayer before you head back. Let's pray as a church family. We pray, come Holy Spirit. Pray that you would fall afresh on the parents in our midst, the educators, the students going back tomorrow or soon. That you would fill them with your peace, with your power. Breath of God, breathe afresh on them as they prepare to go back. We pray for a good night of sleep tonight for peace, for joy, that as they wake up tomorrow, they would know your presence. Pray you would go before them into their dorms, into their lecture halls, their classrooms, their buses, their offices. Go before them, Lord, that that when they walk into those new spaces this week, they would know you're there. You've gone before them. Would you protect them, Lord, sustain them, empower them in the spirit that they would lean not on their own understanding, Lord, but that they would lean instead on the power of the Spirit. Protect them and bless them, we pray, before this new year begins. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thanks for your flexibility this morning as we continue to renew our sanctuary. If you'd like to go inside after and see what's happening, you're more than welcome to do that. Let me just ask a few things. First, don't touch anything. It might fall on you, so don't touch anything. Uh, Stay out of the transepts and out of the balcony. There's some pews stacked up in the transepts and balcony. And finally, don't let your kids run around unattended. Uh, But you're welcome to see what's happening in the sanctuary afterwards if you'd like to. And uh, we'll keep in touch with you. And we will keep you informed. In just a few moments, we will come forward to the Lord's table for communion. It's the Lord's table. We come at his invitation. This isn't Turo's table or the Anglican Church's table. 
We're going to be reminded afresh of what God has done for us in Christ, and we will be fed by that again. Praise God. What we're going to do is divide this group up into like four squares. So there'll be a station here, sort of by this speaker, a station here, kind of by this speaker. You can tell we're sort of <laughs> going to improvise a bit as we do this. Another station uh, out there and another station out there. Just either follow the ushers or uh, just have fun figuring it out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we will hand you the bread. You can take that, and then you may dip it in the wine if you'd like, as we remember what God has done for us, and we feast upon his grace yet again. Finally, let me pray for anybody. We'll pray for anybody celebrating a birthday or an anniversary. If that's you, raise your hand or embarrass the person next to you if they're being sheepish. And uh, we will pray. I'm guessing Sundriana is celebrating a birthday. I don't know. Something tells me. All right, let's pray for our brothers and sisters as they celebrate. This prayer is in your worship guide. Oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We come to the Lord's table now, remembering what he has done for us. So if you're able, would you please stand? Liturgy can be found in your worship guide as we worship God together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and with archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Together, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. And as our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory so that we may come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim loudly the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the Yeah. 
holy name For he is greatly He is greatly To be praised To be praised Magnify Magnify His holy name His holy name For he is greatly He is greatly To be praised What shall we do? What shall we do? shall praise him what shall we do for our god made a way we'll give him our thanks sing that again what shall we do what shall we do we shall lift up a shout what shall we do we shall praise him what shall we do for our cry out we're gonna drown them out with a louder shout of praise even when the battle roars we're gonna praise you lord and you are always worthy and even if the rocks cry out we're gonna drown them out with a louder shout of praise even when the battle roars we're gonna praise you lord We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you our worship, our praise, our adoration. You are faithful. You are worthy. You are for us. You are with us. And you have fed us, God. And so now we continue together in prayer, giving you our thanks. Let's pray together this prayer, praying as God's people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart all the people who've worked so hard to make today happen, our wonderful staff, our wonderful volunteers. Uh, You're too many to name, so thank you. Can we thank together all those who have made this happen? Thank you all. Thank you, you guys. As we used to say where I grew up, all y'all, or uh, from Pittsburgh, all yins, yins. Anyways, I don't speak Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburghian. Receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now as we go, just our voices only, let's fill Fairfax City with the doxology together as we sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen.